Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the MOOC NPTEL course on Bioengineering and Interface with Biology and Medicine. In our uh, interactive session with clinicians, uh, today we are going to uh, have with us Dr. Mala Kaneria, who is going to share the clinician's perspective on biology for engineers. Dr. Mala Kaneria is a professor and unit head of Department of Medicine at TN Medical College and BYEL Nair Hospital. She is professor and unit head at Kasturba Infectious Disease Hospital. Dr. Kaneri also heads the geriatric OPD in TNMC and BYL Nair Hospital. Her special interests include infectious disease and tropical medicine. She is a member of advisory board of General of Association of Physicians of India and she is an ex guest editor of the Journal of General Medicine. Dr. Mala is the principal investigator in projects on malaria. She is a member of Hospital Infection Control Committee at TNMC and a member of Airborne Infection Control Committee. She has been teaching undergrad and postgraduates, dental students for over 22 years and has guided more than 15 PG students for their dissertation work. Dr. Kaneria has authored more than 70 publications and she is recipient of several awards. In 2009, she was awarded the fellowship of the Indian College of Physicians by the API in 2009. She also obtained MJ Shah award to evaluate the levels of procalcitonin in febrile patients at the Epicon 2010 held at Jaipur among several others. It is a great pleasure to have Dr. Mala with us today. She is going to pose many challenging questions for you in which way the engineering devices more accurate detection could benefit clinicians especially for many type of confounding infectious diseases, what kind of dilemmas the clinicians may have and she is going to really intrigue you with those questions and then probably it will you know open up your thought process that in which way engineering can really make a huge impact in the medicine area. With that, let me welcome Dr. Mala for today's lecture. Good evening everyone. I believe this is your uh, first day today, is that right? And you are all uh, computer science students and are expected to do a six month posting in biology which is supposed to be very interesting. I don't know how interesting biology is going to be for computer students, but I'll try my best to arouse some interest in y'all. Okay, so technology is progressively playing a bigger and bigger role in our lives today. And the changes in technology have brought about immeasurable benefits to society at large. There is no branch or no aspect of medicine which technology has not touched including cardiology, neurology, oncology, rheumatology and including infectious diseases which are too many around the world but the common ones that we encounter in Mumbai which we encounter commonly are the monsoon related illnesses, tuberculosis, HIV and the infections associated with the immunosuppression because of HIV. Now, microbiology is gradually changing from streaking to amplification. I don't know what you all have learned previously in 12th and all, but I'm sure you all all know that initially in microbiology, streaking of the sample was done and the organism was cultured, which was a very long process. And now it has moved over the past decade to amplification where the results are supposed to be uh, given to us much faster. PCR based assays have led the way into this era 
the main advantage of pcr based assays or molecular assays are that they are very fast so speed is one big advantage and the second big advantage is they are able to culture or they are able to grow or detect organisms that were previously unculturable or very difficult or impossible to detect so that is a very important aspect or important advantage of pcr but in reality has technology in the microbiology laboratory and have pcr based technique lived up to their promise so ideally this is what you should get a perfect result where the clinician is left with no doubt as to what the organism is however in reality this is what you see all sorts of indeterminate tests and the clinician is as clueless as he was earlier so as with new technologies certain questions arise which can limit the clinical utility of the test such as how long should we expect the dna of that particular organism to persist after recovery or treatment and in what body fluids or tissues will they persist that means once a patient is successfully treated and you send pcr and it still comes positive so is it a false positive is it a dead organism or a non viable organism that your pcr has picked up how can you distinguish between colonization and infection if your pcr is positive from a sputum sample then how do you know that this organism which the pcr has shown is actually the organism which is causing the infection or is just a harmless contaminant or a colonizer is the detection of dna from microorganisms from so called sterile sites a normal variant a, a site which is supposed to be sterile for example if you grow candida organism candida is a fungus which if you grow from a sputum sample then should you treat it is it a contaminant the limitations of these molecular methods are reliable tests are not available for many infectious agents then we have transportation problems low concentrations of infectious agent contamination of the sample non specific amplification operator related errors giving rise to false positive and false negative tests unknown extent of dna in the normal host tissues unknown concentration of the agent material in small volume sample supposing a sputum sample you send just 2 cc of the sputum then is it the correct result that you are getting lack of necessary resources because these pcr based tests are quite costly and difficulty with validation based on the conventional microbiology methods unlike bacterial culture which can detect a large number of cultivable bacteria without knowing what organism is expected in case of pcr based assays you have to use the correct primer by suspecting a particular organism so these are some of the disadvantages of molecular based assays so from research to practice are we lost in translation there are some gaps or some elements which we need to negotiate to start any project you need a correct team good adequate resources and a clear cut purpose as to what you exactly want being a part of a premier institution like iit i'm sure you will not have a problem in getting adequate resources and the team also would not be a problem however the purpose has to be absolutely clear so the clear purpose in this situation is to transform the scientific discoveries arising from the laboratory into clinical application the discoveries that you make the research that you do have to be beneficial to the clinician and if it is not beneficial to the clinician then all this research goes into the waste paper basket so at the end of all this technological advance the physician or the clinician is still as perplexed as earlier after receiving the results from the laboratory and doesn't know how to go ahead with the treatment plan these are some of the challenging cases in infectious diseases which i thought i'll discuss with you all now during the monsoons as i'm sure you all must be aware after the 2005 deluge we literally have a deluge of all these illnesses which we collectively called as monsoon related illnesses 
Now these illnesses are malaria, lepto, dengue, this time we had chikungunya also, infectious diarrhea including cholera, hepatitis A and E, enteric fever which is your typhoid, viral infections. Now all these infections unfortunately have overlapping signs and symptoms. So the cardinal symptoms of all these illnesses collectively are common symptoms like fever, flu-like symptoms that is body ache, sore throat, runny nose, joint pains, vomiting, diarrhea. Now diarrhea can happen in malaria also where we classically expect just fever with rigors where it is called as algid malaria. So when a patient comes to you clinically, it is very difficult to diagnose the patient. Now patients of malaria, lepto, dengue, they all may have jaundice also that is yellowish discoloration of the sclera and so also viral hepatitis. As far as investigations are concerned, we we'll all must be aware about thrombocytopenia or a low platelet count. Low platelet count again is encountered in all the infections which I listed earlier. So unless you have an accurate diagnosis from the laboratory, you end up treating the patient empirically and treating the patient for malaria and leptospirosis and probably if it is long-standing fever then some other antibiotics also. Now this is a patient who has a rash. This is the body of a patient with a rash. Now a skin rash, a macular rash which is seen in this picture can be seen in dengue, it can be seen in chikungunya, it can be seen in viral fever. Also if a patient goes to a general practitioner for fever and he gives him some antibiotics or some anti-inflammatory, drug induced rash can also be seen. So by looking at the rash one doesn't know what is the cause of the rash. This is a patient who has this x-ray. As you can see, I know you are not familiar with x-rays but still these are all reticulonodular shadows throughout the lung fields. This could be a finding seen in miliary or disseminated tuberculosis or it could be a finding in leptospirosis where you get intrapulmonary hemorrhages or it could be adult respiratory distress syndrome which occurs in any severe infection or any septic condition. Now the treatment for all the conditions is different. If it is leptospirosis, I would treat this by giving the patient steroids and if the patient has miliary TB, then steroids would be contraindicated. That means you cannot give the patient steroids. So that means you need an accurate and early diagnosis. This is a patient of leptospirosis who has got this jaundice and subconjunctival hemorrhage on both sides in both the eyes. This again can be seen in leptospirosis, in any septic condition. It can happen whenever there is a low platelet count. So here again, these findings are clinically overlapping. This is a patient of TB who has come after treatment of this tuberculous lymph node with an increase in size. Now this could be because of a paradoxical reaction due to immune reconstitution in TB or it could be because of multi-drug resistant TB. So unless you have a proper diagnosis, you don't know how to treat the patient because MDR-TB would need a second line anti-tuberculous treatment whereas a paradoxical reaction needs only anti-inflammatory drugs. This is a sputum sample which shows these acid fast bacilli which are mycobacterium tuberculosis, the causative organism of TB. Now you are not able to see from this smear and even from PCR whether the organisms are dead or alive. So if you have treated the patient successfully and you are following up the patient and you get this report, they are not able to make out on the report whether it is viable or dead. Now in patient who has got AIDS or HIV, as the immunosuppression increases, the patient gets a number of opportunistic infections. These are all the opportunistic infections which a patient of HIV can get and they can present with this sort of x-ray which could be either TB or any of the opportunistic infection in HIV like pneumocystis carinae pneumonia which is a fungus or again TB or this is a non-tuberculous mycobacteria or some other OI. 
So unless we have a good diagnosis when we send the sputum sample, we don't know how to treat the patient. This is again a patient of HIV who has come with this CT scan. Everybody knows what is a CT scan? A brain imaging. Now these kind of lesions are described as ring enhancing lesions. Ring enhancing lesions could be anything. They have a number of differential diagnoses. It could be tuberculomas like is seen on this side. It could be, this is toxoplasmosis, this is tuberculoma. It could be a primary CNS lymphoma. It could be some malignancy. So, the gold standard for diagnosis is a brain biopsy. However, we need a non-invasive test. For example, if you do a CSF and you send the CSF sample and you get a diagnosis because the treatment for all these conditions is different. This is a case of primary CNS lymphoma in a patient of HIV. This also classifies as a ring enhancing lesion. So the clinician is confused as to what to treat the patient with and many times the patient ends up being treated for toxoplasmosis and tuberculosis and antifungal treatment. Now another common challenging situation for an ID physician is a PUO that is pyrexia of unknown origin or also called as FUO that is fever of unknown origin where the patient has fever for a prolonged period more than three weeks and one doesn't know the diagnosis. The causes could be infective, neoplastic that is malignancy, connective tissue disease or any other cause. So while the patient is being worked up and your reports are coming in, it is almost three to four weeks and in the interim period you are treating the patient with unnecessary antibiotics and this gives rise to antibiotic resistance and in spite of extensive investigations, these are a lot of antibody, I think this is not seen very clearly, a lot of antibody tests in the patient of PUO and some 5-6 autoantibody tests are positive. And this patient is febrile since more than a month and we still don't have a diagnosis. And the same patient's HIV report which were earlier non-reactive has now come reactive. This is a patient who has got a diabetic foot. This wound can grow a number of organisms. This patient who is a diabetic patient can also have urinary tract infection which can have a number of organisms and the clinician is confused as to what to treat the patient with. And then when you are working up the patient and giving the patient unnecessary antibiotics, today we are encountering bacteria which are resistant to a number of antibiotics. These are called as multi-drug resistant antibiotics, which is a big thing because we are abusing antibiotics. They are abused both by the general population, by the lay people and by doctors. And this is because we don't get a diagnosis, an accurate diagnosis rapidly. So we have a problem. We need to analyze the problem and we need to come to a solution of this problem. So these are some situations which can benefit an ID physician. The entry of a febrile potentially infected patient into the healthcare system initiates a diagnostic cycle. That means you do a lot of tests which can take more than 24 hours. Now if this diagnostic cycle or the cycle of investigation can be shortened to less than 2 hours, preferably to less than 30 to 60 minutes, then it would help a critically ill patient who would die if appropriate treatment is not started immediately. So, we have these point of care tests or this POCTs. So, the need of the R is to develop point of care tests which are already available, which address biomarkers which are already available in the laboratory setting but which are not available at the site where the patient is there. So you have this light test or these dip tests which can give results in 30 to 60 minutes and enable the physician to treat the patient soon. So you have a number of biomarkers which you can direct your research towards and produce these point of care tests. Then earlier a sample used to be subjected to a single investigation the result used to be negative, it used to come back, then we used to send for another organism. But now this 
newer state of the art next generation sequencing enables a single sample to be tested within 24 hours for a number of organisms and this has the potential to turn around the infectious diseases testing system. Another area is personalized medicine that means usually when we study organisms we direct our efforts towards the, the microbiome of the organism only. But if we study the human being also and the genetic makeup of the human being, we will better be able to exploit molecular diagnostics. So the gene expert enables us to make a rapid diagnosis of mycobacterium tuberculosis and the resistance pattern. But if we study the genotype of the individual, people who have this N-acetyltransferase 2 genotype, they are more prone to have liver damage because of isoniazid which is an anti-tuberculous drug. So if we know beforehand that this patient has the N-acetyl-2 N-acetyltransferase 2 genotype, we will avoid INH or give it in a lower dose and give him some other anti-tuberculous drug so that he does not develop liver damage due to isoniazid. Then for syndromic infections like bloodstream, respiratory or urinary tract infections that are potentially caused by a large spectrum of organism, you can have a single panel to detect all these organisms with just one sample of blood. But again, sample of blood or whatever other fluid is involved. But the disadvantage of this, this method again is that if your sensitive test springs up a number of organisms, you are unable to decide whether which one is the true infection and which is the contaminant. So these are certain drawbacks of these tests. So this is the iPhone which has been converted into a blood parasite detector. This is the device which can be connected to the iPhone and a 5 second record of the sample can be taken to detect the parasites rapidly. This could be used for TB for malaria and then if this is given to a clinician, our work would definitely be much faster. This is the same thing, the device which I was mentioning is the cell scope LOA to look for the African eye worm and this is a blood sample and this is a device which is attached to the iPhone. And if we could get something like this, a pathogen extracting sepsis therapy, a blood cleansing therapy which could cleans all the organism. It would be wonderful for physicians. Then a panel for TB diagnosis, a panel for drug susceptibility and a panel to see the response to treatment. This is something which would help us a lot because tuberculosis is extremely rampant in our country. So the wish list of an infectious disease physician is a test that is able to distinguish between infectious and non-infectious conditions like collagen vascular disease and malignancy because the patient presents with fever in all three scenarios. Test to detect pathogens with accuracy especially when there are two sites of infection like a urinary tract infection and cellulitis or a UTI and a pneumonia. A test that is able to distinguish between a true infection and a contamination a test to guide antibiotic therapy, something like procalcitonin. Now, procalcitonin is a marker of bacterial sepsis. This can distinguish between a bacterial and a viral infection, but it is not very sensitive and specific. So, something like this, because if it's a bacterial infection, you need to start antibiotics, whereas a viral infection does not need antibiotics. Test which is extremely sensitive and specific can be detected very early is able to diagnose the condition even if the patient comes late after the acute phase. For example, infection like leptospirosis causes kidney injury. So if your patient comes after three weeks just with the kidney injury, you are able to still diagnose leptospirosis as the cause and not subject the patient to unnecessary kidney biopsy and other tests. A test which is able to work even when the sample is possibacillary that means when there are very few number of bacilli, a test which is able to predict the severity, a test which can be utilized for prognostication, that means prognosis, that means that this patient is going to 
recover or he is going to not recover. A test which is above all very, very, very affordable, especially in a state and government run hospital. Test which can reliably distinguish between bacterial and viral infections and of course to develop newer effective drugs and vaccines for these major illnesses which our whole city is grappling against that is malaria and now of course dengue also, TB and HIV. So with the help of technology, can we cure all diseases in our children's lifetime? You will all know who is this, right? Good. So to conclude, molecular diagnostics will continue to evolve, but not all methods and markers will survive. But those that do will complement the rapidly proliferating menu of molecular diagnostic services. Clinical utility may not necessarily correspond directly to the quantum of tests performed. All your tests are not going to be helpful to clinicians. Emphasis on translational research will transform scientific discoveries arising from the laboratory into clinical application. So, to change the world, we need to combine ancient wisdom with new technologies. Clinical acumen has to be sound, but new technologies are always welcome, which will lead the way forward. And you in IIT, with the help of technology, will enable us to bridge the gap between the laboratory and practice, the microbiologist and the physician. Thank you.